On the Mexican War by Thomas Corwin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The President has said he does not expect to hold Mexican territory by conquest. Why then conquer it? Why waste thousands of lives and millions of money fortifying towns and creating governments? if at the end of the war you retire from the graves of your soldiers and the desolated country of your foes only to get money from mexico for the expense of all your toil and sacrifice who ever heard since christianity was propagated among men of a nation taxing its people enlisting its young men and marching off two thousand miles to fight a people merely to be paid for it in money what is this but hunting a market for blood selling the lives of your young men marching them in regiments to be slaughtered and paid for like oxen and brute beasts sir this is when stripped naked that atrocious idea first promulgated in the president's message and now advocated here of fighting on till we can get our indemnity for the past as well as the present slaughter we have chastised mexico and if it were worth while to do so we have i dare say satisfied the world that we can fight sir i have no patience with this flagitious notion of fighting for indemnity and this under the equally absurd and hypocritical pretense of securing an honorable peace an honorable peace if you have accomplished the objects of the war if indeed you had an object which you dare to avow cease to fight and you will have peace conquer your insane love of false glory and you will conquer a peace but now you have overrun half of mexico you have exasperated and irritated her people you claim indemnity for all expenses incurred in doing this mischief and boldly ask her to give up new mexico and california and as a bribe to her patriotism seizing on her property you offer three millions to pay the soldiers she has called out to repel your invasion on condition that she will give up to you at least one-third of her whole territory this is the modest i should say monstrous proposition now before us as explained by the chairman of the committee on foreign relations mr sevier who reported the bill i cannot now give my consent to this you may wrest provinces from mexico by war you may hold them by the right of the strongest you may rob her but a treaty of peace to that effect with the people of mexico legitimately and freely made you never will have I thank God that it is so, as well for the sake of the Mexican people as ourselves, for unlike the senator from Alabama, Mr. Bagby, I do not value the life of a citizen of the United States above the lives of a hundred thousand Mexican women and children, a rather cold philanthropy in my judgment. For the sake of Mexico, then, as well as our country, i rejoice that it is an impossibility that you can obtain by treaty from her those territories under the existing state of things you have taken from mexico one-fourth of her territory and you now propose to run a line comprehending about another third and for what i ask mr president for what what has mexico got from you parting with two-thirds of her domain she has given you ample redress for every injury of which you have complained she has submitted to the award of your commissioners and up to the time of the rupture with texas faithfully paid it and for all that she has lost not through or by you but which loss has been your gain what requital do we her strong rich robust neighbor make do we send our missionaries there to point the way to heaven or do we send the schoolmasters to pour daylight into her dark places, to aid her infant strength, to conquer freedom, and reap the fruit of the independence herself alone had won? No, 
No, none of this do we. But we send regiments, storm towns, and our colonels prate of liberty in the midst of the solitudes their ravages have made. They proclaim the empty forms of social compact to a people bleeding and maimed with wounds received in defending their hearthstones against the invasion of those very men who shoot them down and then exhort them to be free. What is this territory, Mr. President, which you propose to wrest from Mexico? It is consecrated to the heart of the Mexican by many a well-fought battle with his old Castilian master. His Bunker Hills and Saratogas and Yorktowns are there. The Mexican can say, There I bled for liberty, and shall I surrender that consecrated home of my affections to the Anglo-Saxon invaders? What do they want with it? They have Texas already. They have possessed themselves of the territory between the Nueces and the Rio Grande. What else do they want? To what shall I point my children as memorials of that independence which I bequeath to them when those battlefields shall have passed from my possession? Sir, had one come and demanded Bunker Hill of the people of Massachusetts, had England's lion ever showed himself there, is there a man over thirteen and under ninety? who would not have been ready to meet him? Is there a river on this continent that would not have run red with blood? Is there a field but would have been piled high with the unburied bones of slaughtered Americans before these consecrated battlefields of liberty should have been wrested from us? But this same American goes into a sister republic and says to poor, weak Mexico, Give up your territory. You are unworthy to possess it. I have got one half already. All I ask of you is to give up the other. Why, says the chairman of this committee on foreign relations, it is the most reasonable thing in the world. We ought to have the Bay of San Francisco. Why? Because it is the best harbor on the Pacific? It has been my fortune, Mr. President, to have practiced a good deal in criminal courts in the course of my life but I never yet heard a thief arraigned for stealing a horse plead that it was the best horse that he could find in the country. We want California? What for? Why, says the senator from Michigan, we will have it. And the senator from South Carolina, with a very mistaken view, I think, of policy, says you cannot keep our people from going there. Let them go and seek their happiness in whatever country or clime it pleases them. All I ask of them is not to require this government to protect them with that banner consecrated to war waged for principles, eternal, enduring truth. Sir, it is not meet that our old flag should throw its protecting folds over expeditions for lucre or for land. But you will say you want room for your people. This has been the plea of every robber chief from Nimrod to the present hour. I dare say, when Tamerlane, descended from his throne, built of seventy thousand human skulls, and marched his ferocious battalions to further slaughter, I dare say, he said, I want room. Bajazet was another gentleman of kindred tastes, and wants with us Anglo-Saxons. He wanted room. Alexander, too, the mighty Macedonian madman, when he wandered with his Greeks to the plains of India and fought a bloody battle on the very ground where recently England and the Sikhs engaged in strife for room, was no doubt in quest of some California there. Many a Monterey had he to storm to get room. Sir, he made quite as much of that sort of history as you ever will. Mr. President, do you remember the last chapter in that history? It is soon read. Oh, I wish we could but understand its moral. Amon's son, so was Alexander named, after all his victories, died drunk in Babylon. The vast empire he conquered to get room became the prey of the generals he had trained. It was disparted, torn to pieces, and so ended. Sir, there is a very significant appendix. It is this. The descendants of the Greeks, of Alexander's Greeks, are now governed by a descendant of Attila. Sir, I have read in some account of your battle of Monterey, of a lovely Mexican girl, who with the benevolence of an angel in her bosom 
and the robust courage of a hero in her heart, was busily engaged during the bloody conflict, amid the crashing of falling houses, the groans of the dying, and the wild shriek of battle, in carrying water to slake the burning thirst of the wounded of either host. While bending over a wounded American soldier, a cannonball struck her and blew her to atoms. Sir, I do not charge my brave, generous-hearted countrymen who fought that fight with us. No, no, we who send them, we who know that scenes like this which might send tears of sorrow down Pluto's iron cheek are the invariable, inevitable attendants on war. We are accountable for this, and this, this is the way we are to be made known to Europe. This, this is to be the undying renown of free Republican America. She has stormed a city, killed many of its inhabitants of both sexes. She has room! So it will read. Sir, if this were our only history, then may God of his mercy grant that its volume may speedily come to a close. Why is it, sir, that we, the United States, a people of yesterday compared with the older nations of the world, should be waging war for territory, for room. Look at your country, extending from the Allegheny Mountains to the Pacific Ocean, capable itself of sustaining and comfort a larger population than will be in the whole Union for one hundred years to come. Over this vast expanse of territory, your population is now so sparse that I believe we provided, at the last session, a regiment of mounted men to guard the mail from the frontier of Missouri to the mouth of the Columbia. And yet you persist in this ridiculous assertion, I want room. One would imagine, from the frequent reiteration of the complaint, that you had a bursting, teeming population, whose energy was paralyzed, whose enterprise was crushed, for want of space. Why would we be so weak or wicked as to offer this idle apology for ravaging a neighboring republic? It will impose on no one at home or abroad. Do we not know, Mr. President, that it is a law never to be repealed, that falsehood shall be short-lived? Was it not ordained of old that truth only shall abide forever? Whatever we may say today, or whatever we may write in our books, the stern tribunal of history will review it all, detect falsehood, and bring us to judgment before that posterity which shall bless or curse us, as we may act now, wisely or otherwise. We may hide in the grave which awaits us all, in vain. We may hope there, like the foolish bird that hides its head in the sand, in the vain belief that its body is not seen. Yet even there this preposterous excuse of want of room shall be laid bare, and the quick-coming future will decide that it was a hypocritical pretense under which we sought to conceal the avarice which prompted us to covet and to seize by force that which was not ours. Mr. President, this uneasy desire to augment our territory has depraved the moral sense and blunted the otherwise keen sagacity of our people. What has been the fate of all nations who have acted upon the idea that they must advance? Our young orators cherish this notion with a fervid but fatally mistaken zeal. They call it by the mysterious name of destiny. Our destiny, they say, is onward, and hence they argue, with ready sophistry, the propriety of seizing upon any territory and any people that may lie in the way of our fated advance. Recently these progressives have grown classical. Some assiduous student of antiquities has helped them to a patron saint. They have wandered back into the desolate pantheon, and there, among the polytheistic relies of that pale mother of dead empires, they have found a god whom these Romans, centuries gone by, baptized Terminus. Sir, I have heard much and read somewhat of this gentleman Terminus. Alexander, of whom I have spoken, was a devotee of this divinity. We have seen the end of him and his empire. It was said to be an attribute of this god that he must always advance and never recede. So both Republican and Imperial Rome believed. It was, as they said, their destiny. And for a while it did seem to be even so. 
Roman Terminus did advance. Under the eagles of Rome, he was carried from his home on the Tiber to the farthest east on the one hand, and to the far west, among the then barbarous tribes of Western Europe on the other. But at length the time came when retributive justice had become a destiny. The despised Gaul calls out the contemned Goth, and Attila with his Huns answers back the battle shout to both. The blue eyed nations of the north, in succession or united, pour forth their countless hosts of warriors upon Rome, and Rome's always advancing god Terminus. And now the battle axe of the barbarian strikes down the conquering eagle of Rome. Terminus at last recedes, slowly at first, but finally he is driven to Rome, and from Rome to Byzantium. Whoever would know the further fate of this Roman deity, so recently taken, under the patronage of American democracy, may find ample gratification of his curiosity in the luminous pages of Gibbon's Decline and Fall. Such will find that Rome thought as you now think, that it was her destiny to conquer provinces and nations, and no doubt she sometimes said, as you say, I will conquer a peace, and where now is she, the mistress of the world? The spider weaves his webs in her palaces, the owl sings his watch-song in her towers, Teutonic power now lords it over the servile remnant, the miserable memento of old and once omnipotent Rome. Sad, very sad, are the lessons which time has written for us. Through and in them all I see nothing but the inflexible execution of that old law which ordains as eternal that cardinal rule, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods, nor anything which is his. Since I have lately heard so much about the dismemberment of Mexico, I have looked back to see how, in the course of events which some call providence, it has fared with other nations who engaged in this work of dismemberment. I see that in the latter half of the eighteenth century, three powerful nations, Russia, Austria, and Prussia, united in the dismemberment of Poland. They said, too, as you say, it is our destiny. They wanted room. Doubtless each of these thought, with his share of Poland, his power was too strong ever to fear invasion or even insult. One had his California, another his New Mexico, and the third his Veracruz. Did they remain untouched and incapable of harm? Alas, no, far, very far from it. Retributive justice must fulfill its destiny, too. A very few years pass off, and we hear of a new man, a Corsican lieutenant, the self-named armed soldier of democracy, Napoleon. He ravages Austria, covers her land with blood, drives the northern Caesar from his capital, and sleeps in his palace. Austria may now remember how her power trampled upon Poland. Did she not pay dear, very dear, for her California? But has Prussia no atonement to make? You see this same Napoleon, the blind instrument of providence, at work there. The thunders of his cannon at Jena proclaim the work of retribution for Poland's wrongs, and the success of the great Frederick, the drill sergeant of Europe, are seen flying across the sandy plain that surrounds their capital, right glad if they may escape captivity or death. But how fares it with the autocrat of Russia? Is he secure in his share of the spoils of Poland? No. Suddenly we see, sir, six hundred thousand armed men marching to Moscow. Does his Veracruz protect him now? Far from it. Blood, slaughter, desolation spread abroad over the land and finally the conflagration of the old commercial metropolis of Russia closes the retribution she must pay for her share in the dismemberment of her weak and impotent neighbor. Mr. President, a mind more prone to look for the judgments of heaven in the doings of men than mine cannot fail in this to see the providence of God. When Moscow burned, it seemed as if the earth was lighted up that the nations might behold the scene. 
as that mighty sea of fire gathered and heaved and rolled upward, and yet higher till its flames licked the stars, and fired the whole heavens. It did seem as though the God of the nations was writing in characters of flame on the front of his throne, that doom shall fall upon the strong nation which tramples in scorn upon the weak. And what fortune awaits him, the appointed executor of this work, when it was all done? He, too, conceived the notion that his destiny pointed onward to universal dominion. France was too small. Europe, he thought, should bow down before him. But as soon as this idea took possession of his soul, he, too, became powerless. His terminus must recede, too. Right there, while he witnessed the humiliation, and doubtless meditated the subjugation of Russia, he who holds the winds in his fist gathered the snows of the north and blew them upon his six hundred thousand men. They fled, they froze, they perished. And now the mighty Napoleon, who has resolved on universal dominion, he too is summoned to answer for the violation of that ancient law. Thou shalt not covet anything which is thy neighbor's. How is the mighty fallen? He, beneath whose proud footstep Europe trembled, he is now an exile at Elba, and now finally a prisoner on the rock of St. Helena, and there, on a barren island, in an unfrequented sea, in the crater of an extinguished volcano, there is the deathbed of the mighty conqueror. All his annexations have come to that. His last hour is now come, and he, the man of destiny, he who had rocked the world, as with the throes of an earthquake, is now powerless still, even as a beggar, so he died. On the wings of a tempest that raged with unwanted fury, up to the throne of the only power that controlled him while he lived, went the fiery soul of that wonderful warrior, another witness to the existence of that eternal decree that they who do not rule in righteousness shall perish from the earth. He has found room at last. And France, she too has found room. Her eagles now no longer scream along the banks of the Danube, the Po, and the Boristhenes. They have returned home to their old Eyrie, between the Alps, the Rhine, and the Pyrenees. So it shall be with yours. You may carry them to the loftiest peaks of the Cordilleras. They may wave with insolent triumph in the halls of the Montezumas. The armed men of Mexico may quail before them. But the weakest hand in Mexico, uplifted in prayer to the God of justice, may call down against you a power in the presence of which the iron hearts of your warriors shall be turned into ashes. End of On the Mexican War by Thomas Corwin Recording by Guero